Okay, good evening. I'm Susan Andreata, Professor of Anthropology, and I'm here along with my Cultural Anthropology Methods course and other guests. I'm here to introduce Ms. Brenda Bergen Ross, our guest speaker, who will be sharing with us reflections from her Peace Corps days in Liberia. Let me tell you about Ms. Ross to put things in context for us. Ms. Ross received her BS in Food Nutrition and Food Service Management from UNCG in 1974. And from there, she joined the Peace Corps. Okay, keep that in mind. She would have been 21? 22. 22. Upon returning, she completed a two-year post-BS dietetic internship at Forsyth Medical Center in Winston-Salem. She also received a post-BS certificate in gerontology from UNCG and completed her master's in gerontology. Her credentials, which include an MS, an RDN, an LDN, and a food, wait a minute, an FN, F -A -N -N -D. I'm sure all of those are her licensure for being a nutrition and food expert. Her credentials has led her to an impressive career working in food and nutrition services, including being director of food services at Medical Park Hospital in Winston-Salem, as the operation manager of food and nutrition services at Duke University Medical Center, director of food and nutrition services at Chardo Medical Corporations at Chardo Hills Hospital, and served many more places in the Piedmont as well as moving north to, north to Philadelphia for a, little, for a little bit. In 1991, she established her, her own health care consultancy services, and it's still ongoing. By 2008, she became a lecturer in the Department of Nutrition. She moved up the ranks to associate professors and received many teaching awards. She has now joined the ranks of emeritus faculty members from UNCG because she retired in July of 2021. As my dear friend, Ms. Ross, has said on more than one occasion, she loves anthropology. And me, as a fellow foodie, I have said to her, I have loved what she's been able to do to help people learn about food and nutrition with a cross-cultural understanding. Over the summer, Ms. Ross donated a number of artifacts to UNCG's Jackson Library Special Collection that were given to her as a Peace Corps volunteer. She will share some stories about these items during her presentation. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce you to Ms. Bergen Ross, who will be speaking about her Peace Corps days in, in Monrovia, Lib Liberia. I know she will welcome questions about her experience. She too has read notes from a mud hut there might be some barley questions you have for her for comparative purposes. They're not next neighbors, Liberia and, and in the Cameroon, but there might be some similarities to field work. Okay, so write your questions and ask away. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Andreata and I became friends through the community garden project which she diligently works in, and I occasionally would show up. <laughs> but I used to encourage the nutrition students to do the gardening, and a lot of them found it very rewarding. Thank you. It's still going on. It's still going on, 13 yeah. years. Wow. As she said, I retired last year, and I'm enjoying retirement. Let me tell you, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I, I'm not one that likes to read slides, so I put things up here so you can get the gist of the matter, and I will try to do more talking from the slides, if that's all right. And yes, that was me. Now I have gray hair, but back then I had naturally brown hair, and I was 22 years old, about as naive as I could be in many ways. Where are you from? I grew up near Asheville. I literally came from the hills, and UNCG was the place that opened a lot of doors for me, but Liberian Peace Corps experience opened a lot of doors too. Every time I applied for a job, that was the one thing they talked to me about. It's like, that has nothing to do with my credentials as a dietitian. <laughs> but people wanted to know. So it does open doors. Now, I'm not an anthropologist. I'm a dietitian. My area is nutrition. I have no training in anthropology, which I regret. I would have liked to have taken a course. And I didn't do this kind of field research. 
So you feel free to ask me, or if you need to clarify how something might translate over into the work that you would do. I do think I'm a frustrated social worker and anthropologist. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have gone to Africa, but I knew in 1970 I wanted to go to the Peace Corps. I was a child of the Kennedy era, and I knew that's where I wanted to go, and I was pretty clear at the end of uh, the four years I wanted Africa. In those days, you could go to South America, India, Africa. I, I don't know why India didn't appeal to me. I was never one that studied Spanish, so South America didn't appeal to me. In fact, Peace Corps volunteers were often confused as CIA agents in South America, so it wasn't as safe of a place. I just wanted to, do, wanted to go to Africa, so I did in June of 1974. Now, so you'll know, this is Liberia. I'll give you a little more map detail that you uh, will get to see greater detail. It's the brown one. Oh yeah, that's Cameroon. Yeah, from the book. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Liberia is about the size of the state of Ohio. It's a small country by many, um, by many measures. It sits really close to the equator. You can see the equator here. So yeah, it was 90 degrees, 90% 90 humidity year round. We had two seasons, rainy season, dry season. Rainy season, it was mud. Dry season, it was dirt, dust. So you always had to, you know, protect your eyes and your hair from, from dirt, from dust. But there's Liberia. This is a little more, um, of a larger map, you will see the counties. They, they have counties. Now, interestingly, there are 27 tribes within that, that country the size of Ohio, 27 distinct tribal groups, along with people from other cultures living there, Middle Easterners, Muslims. So it wasn't just Liberians that, that lived in the country. But, uh, and good luck pronouncing the names. I had to learn right away how to pronounce Bonga, which is right up here. See the Bong County, Bonga. So you had to learn, you know, where the G was silent. But anyway, Liberia was the only independent nation never colonized in Africa. So the British, the French, the Germans, the Italians never had any kind of colony there. They were founded by freed slaves in 19, in 1822 who left the U.S. to go back to their uh, their homeland as they saw it. But interestingly, there were two layers of society. You had the people that were descended from the slaves, and then there's there are several books written, and they're called by different names, but most often I heard American Liberians. So they were considered by Liberians to be American Liberians. Then the other folks were really the indigenous people totally separate in many ways. Um, guess who had all the money and the power? The American Liberians. And the education. They had very close ties to the U.S. They loved Kennedy. Kennedy was the only U.S. president that went there. And when Nixon resigned, my neighbor Peter came running over because he listened to the BBC to tell me, you have corrupt politicians too. <laughs> Yes, we do. <laughs> and, um, but close relationship to the U.S. In spite of that, they had a horrible civil war that started in 89 and went to 96 where a lot of people died. And if you hear the talk about blood diamonds, it actually started in Sierra Leone to the north and bled into Liberia. And it was just a bunch of warlords fighting each over, over control. Interestingly, there's a really good documentary, if you, if you want to see it, called Pray the Devil Back to Hell. And it shows that women from Sierra Leone and Liberia, women that were tribal, women that were Muslim, women that were American Liberians, all came together and got that war stopped, protesting. <laughs> which is really, uh, that's a good documentary. You don't see footage actually of the time during the war because child soldiers were a part of it. Okay, not gonna read it, but you will have the, did you wanna post these for them later? Okay, you can, you 
fine, and I'll give you a revised version. Okay. Okay. There's the mission of the Peace Corps. You know, we're there to train other people. We tr we're there to be good ambassadors and to get to know the Liberians and for them to get to know Americans. So here's how I saw our responsibilities, uh, both from the perspective of the U.S. Peace Corps, which is a government agency. We were government employees. We had a low grade in, as a government employee, but we had a government passport. And then the responsibilities I saw that we uh, were charged with bringing forth. But first and foremost, the Peace Corps makes it very clear that the safety of the volunteers is important. My father died when I was there. The day after my father died, there was a plane in my village to pick me up, flew to the capital. My passport was ready. My ticket was ready. I landed in Asheville two day, on a Friday, and he died on a Wednesday. So they do take care of us, both your medical care, your safety, but, but also in t you know when things happen. We were screened because they want to know that you've got the, I guess, the psychological fortitude to stick this out. Because it, Liberia in those days, and it's not a lot different now because the war just erased any progress that would have been made between when I was there now but there's no running water. There's no electricity in many places. There are no bathrooms. So pre-screening was important because you were put in an area by yourself frequently as the only volunteer in that, in that village. And you just had to survive with your, your wits and keep yourself entertained and immerse yourself in the culture. So a lot of pre-screening went into this. In spite of that, we still had volunteers who lost it, for lack of a better word. One guy decided he was going to swim back to America from the west coast of Africa to the east coast of the U.S. Um, so people do have psychological breakdowns. And, and again, their responsibility was to take care of that volunteer and get them out. They gave us pretty good medical care because I had to go into the Peace Corps office every six months and bend over and get popped in the backside with numerous injections. We had yellow fever, cholera, rabies, um, gamma globulins, just to keep our immune system strong, a host of things. So before you went, you had to get all your immunizations and then every six months they did. And that was when I think the Peace Corps doctor did sort of an evaluation, how are you doing? Now, if you needed to go in in between with an illness, it was there, but the Peace Corps office was in Monrovia. I was three days away from that. <laughs> They did give us uh, prophylactic treatment for malaria, chloroquine to prevent it, but also uh, a first aid kit and various things we could, uh, and told us how to treat things that came up. And yeah, I had malaria twice. And I was glad I had the medication for that. It lasted about three days. I had amoebic dysentery once. That lasted more than a week. I lost 20 pounds, I think, with amoebic dysentery. But you're young. You're healthy. You can survive it. I don't know if I'd do that now. <laughs> okay. Am I going too fast? Got a lot of slides, so, and I tend to talk fast. If I, if I get to going too fast, you can give me a slowdown signal. So, from what I see, uh, Peace Corps also gave us really good training. We were put in the Capitol for six weeks where we had training on culture. What's, what you can do and what you can't do and when you should do it. Some language training, but remember, 27 tribes, there's no way they could teach. I guess there were 30 people in my group, 30 people going into different parts of the country, the different dialects they needed. So you were sort of expected to learn that when you got a country. Um, some, some aspects of the culture, and this was my group actually. This was my group. We got together in North Carolina, I think 10 years, and I'm still friends with the two women on the right. We get together regularly. One's in Virginia, one's in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I have another friend who's in uh, Denmark, and we stay in contact. But um, you develop a bond with that people. It's, I guess, much like men develop in a war situation or in the military. <laughs> One of the things they tried to expose us to day one was Liberian foods. Because if you were gonna live in the bush, 
there weren't any McDonald's, <laughs> there weren't any stores. You had to eat local food. Now you could buy stuff and carry it up country if you wanted to spend all your money on American food and cans, but that only lasted so long. The first meal I had was fish head soup. It was a soup with fish in it, cut up, and heads. And it was served with rice, and I think I ate rice that day, and papaya. By the time I left, it didn't bother me to have a fish head in my soup. I learned that really good meat is under the gills. <laughs> you will eat what you learn to adapt to. Um, they did give specific orientation dependent upon the group. Some groups go over, they're all educators, some are all nurses. Some are agriculture, some are healthcare. My group was a mix of agriculture and healthcare. And we had various backgrounds from nutrition to home economics to um, agriculture science. So based on our background, they looked at where we were located. And if you had a master's degree, which I didn't have, you might look out and teach in a local university. I have a friend in Chapel Hill. That was his job. And I always said, boy, they had it made. Because when you're at university, you do have some advantages of, I guess, a different environment. Okay. I was able to pull up this map. This is Liberia. And this is the way it was when I was there. And I think it's still much the same. Um, see if my little pointer will do it. That's the capital. I was right here. I was about as far away as they could put me. The only farther place would have been Harper down there. <laughs> to get from Monrovia, you had to go all the way up here, all the way here, down to here. It took two to three days. So when I had dysentery, it took me two days to get into the capital, which further delayed my treatment. The way we traveled, yes. Yeah, the way we traveled was not by a pretty plane or nice uh, taxi. It was the back of a pickup truck sitting on a wooden bench with a tarp over it. And uh, occasionally they wanted to put the Peace Corps person in the front seat. But if it was an old woman, I wouldn't let them do that. If it was a young man, maybe, but a lot of times it was older women. And I just, no, didn't want to do that. So I climbed into the back, dust. There'd be goats and chickens and um, babies squalling and people, but maybe 12 people in the back of the trunk bed. And we're not talking a Ford 150, whatever those big trucks are. We're talking little trucks. So you would get a, maybe you would make a plan with someone to take you to here. And then you'd get all the way up to here, to Bonga. And that might take you four or five hours. And then you'd get out. That was your contract with that taxi driver and then you'd have to find another taxi driver to take you from there up to there and so on until you got all the way down that's why it took so long now when my father died they flew a plane straight down and they hired somebody in greenville to drive up it was two hours up from greenville to pick me up and I flew out on that plane from my village, which was here, and I realized this was nothing but jungle and rivers. And I thought, if this plane goes down, they'll never find us. <laughs> so I realized then I was really in the middle of the bush. Okay, what I saw as my responsibility was to be a good citizen of the U.S. government, to represent our government. I was there to try to teach skills, but most important, it was to be a representative. I couldn't be political. We did have one woman in our group who decided that she was going to bring feminism to all the ladies, whether they wanted it or not, was trying to um, get them to fight some of the local customs, like the fact that a man can have more than one wife. And she was pretty quickly sent out of the village and sent home. So we weren't there to be political. We had to accept the environment we're in. We had to accept the government, the way things are done, and employ a skill set. Mine was nutrition, but I found out that was only a little bit of what they wanted me to do. 
It's also just to live in that village community and respect people and their customs. Might disagree with it, but that wasn't my place to change them. It was to just try to understand and respect them. In order to do what I wanted to do, I also had to meet with village elders, the local leaders, and say, what is it you want? One thing they wanted was somebody to teach them health in the school. And they wanted me to teach birth control. I'm like, I'm not a nurse, but I can talk about condom use <laughs> because they talked to us about it. The day I, so I did a series of health classes. The day I talked about birth control, there were about 20 men outside the school listening and looking in, which was interesting. And of course, condom use would have prevented HIV, which wasn't an issue in 74, but by 80, 81 it was. But it was to find out what they wanted. So I found myself teaching health. I found myself teaching little girls to sew with a knit and crochet, even though there was not a store that you could buy yarn or crochet hooks from. Uh, but we could teach people to use a needle and a thread and to use their native cloth and to make dresses. Um, and you look at the people, and the people were beautiful. And just there was just an innocence and a beauty about them that you realize right away they're really not any different than me. They have the same desires I do. Health, happiness, long life, their kids to be educated. That was important to a lot of people. I like that slide for this reason. So this is my house right here. It was Carolina blue. Any Carolina fan would have loved that. It was made of mud of sticks, but it looks like cement. And my floor was so hard, it was like cement. Um, I had a well. I could pump water up into a, a, some barrels and gravity would force it into my house. So I was probably better off than most volunteers. But the water was not safe, so I still had to boil it and filter it. The houses in the village looked a lot more like that. And yes, there's always goats and chickens running around. They're in the kitchens or in the houses. I would wake up thinking somebody was looking at me in the window and it'd be three goats. <laughs> I nerfed me like you wouldn't believe to have three goats staring at me. Um, my house also had an outhouse behind it. That was one of the things you have to get used to. But by Six months in, my landlord had put in indoor plumbing. All it was was a toilet that you flushed water down in it, went somewhere. It wasn't a handle. My shower was a Crisco can with holes in it that I held over me. And even in 90 degree weather, I still warmed up my water. <laughs> I didn't want a cold bucket bath. But that was, that was life right there. This was the village elder that I had to work with, the gentleman on the right, who told me what he wanted for his people. The folks on the left, uh, that's my friend Sarah. Sarah, um, which of the artifacts? I'm trying to remember, did Sarah give me? Sarah taught me a lot. I can't remember. Um, sorry, but Sarah's on the outer right and some other folks were tooling along. We were walking to Sarah's farm. The yes. Pot, the pot. The yes. Yes. And um, no, that was Nora. Sarah gave me something different. I know. I have a picture of Nora. But Sarah took me to her village, which you'll see coming forth right here. But I'll come back to it. Before I do, I just wanted to talk more about respect. We had Muslims. And there was an old, old Muslim man in my village who spoke no dialect, he spoke Arabic. So I learned to say a few words in Arabic, you know, hello, how are you, good morning. And every day when I walked to the village, I'd go sit beside him, do my pleasantries. He would do them back, he sat in these long robes. I always thought he was so elegant. This is not him. I had a picture of him at one time, but I couldn't find it. But. It was important that I pay my respect to this gentleman as he was sort of sitting there watching over the rest of the, the village. So uh, this is when I went to Sarah's farm and Ed, who had about 10 pots, maybe more, 
right here, became a curator for the Museum of African Art, was getting his doctorate in um, art from Columbia, came through the area, ended up staying in my village. I cooked every night, included Ed in my food, and he wouldn't give me not one of those pots. But my friend Nora heard me fussing about it, went in her kitchen, brought the pot out and said, here. They didn't want those pots. They wanted the nice silver stainless steel things that I had that were a lot more durable. And the pot was cracked. She said, I can't use it. It's been in my kitchen, I don't know how long. Kitchens are outdoors, that's kitchen. And so um, I had a better pot than Ed did. Sarah was, she was cleaning rice. You washed it and then you did this to get the chaff off and you wash it. But this older lady, and old ma is not a derogatory term, it's a term of reference, like we would refer to our grandmother. Anyway, before this was taken, I was sitting beside her. She had very poor vision. She probably had cataracts. And she didn't realize I was there for about 30 minutes until she turned around and looked at me and in dialect starts screaming, it's a ghost, it's gonna eat me. And Sarah goes, don't pay attention to her. She's just never seen a white person. That entire village had never seen a white person. So they all came out to look at me. And that woman never stopped. The, the thing she was screaming in dialect was, bah, bah, which was like, oh my God, bah. And she kept looking at me and screaming and finally I moved. So anyway, she thought I was a ghost. Um, this is Nora who gave me the pot. No, that's Sarah. There's Nora. She was getting her hair done in the middle of when someone came to take a photograph and they did my hair that way. Patted me up one day and said, now you look like a real Liberian woman, not a small girl. They thought I was a small girl. You have no breast. You have no babies. <laughs> You're a young girl. Um, but anyway, she was getting her hair done and that's Sarah. And that's another volunteer that was about two hours up from me that was in my group and she had come down to visit. Volunteers do go visit each other from time to time. But we didn't have cars, so two hours is a long ride on a money bus. This was my neighbor, uh, Eddie. This was his family and um, men have more than one wife. So you will see multiple women and lots of babies. Nora's husband had two other wives. Now Sarah's husband did, but she was the number one wife. And number one wife is the number one wife. She gets priority over everything. I don't know if Nora was her husband's number one wife, but he treated all three equally. Nora was of that tribal group. The other wife was another tribal group, and the third wife was Muslim, and he was Muslim. So there's a lot of intermingling and no issue with religion or um, with the fact that there are different tribal groups. So this is how houses were built. They start with sticks, they pack them with mud, do a thatched roof, and they're pretty secure. My house had a tin roof. So when it rains, rained, I could hear, you know, that loud noise. But also the way my house was built with a tin roof, I didn't get rats inside or mice or anything else. I could hear them running on the roof at night, but they couldn't get in. But this is Eddie, my neighbor on the right side. Peter was on my left side. And Eddie's actually doing an extension on his house. And you can see he's got sticks and, and um, getting ready to extend it out. That's the shower. A lot of volunteers had that same kind of shower. You were lucky you had privacy. Pieces of tin and a cloth. Mine was inside. So I was really lucky because I had just a square space with a hole in the ground and I could take a shower in privacy. People were always wanting to know was I white underneath kids. So privacy was a big issue <laughs> when you're taking a shower. They would, kids are funny, they would just pull your shirt down. You know, are you white under there? Is that paint? No, that's me. Um, so we'll talk about village life. These women are all married and they're probably not more than 15 years old with babies probably marry at the age of 13. 
Um, they, I don't know if they were married to the same man or they were just friends, but it's possible they were all married to the same man. And those would be his children. Now, a lot of people had issue with that. Like I said, one of the women in my group wanted to bring the feminist in and let's change all that. But you think about it. Look what women do. Take care of the babies. There's more than one there, right? In a bunch. They do all the cooking. They do all the laundry. They do the farm work. What do men do? Mostly farm work or run a business. They like sharing those duties. One would be cooking, one would be on the farm, the other would be doing the laundry. They liked having the division of labor. And I thought, yeah, it sort of makes sense. The man's duty was to make sure they were all taken care of. Children do a lot of the helping with cooking and washing, doing laundry and stuff like that. But women have a much heavier role in the family than men do. Now, that's Nora. That's a horrible picture because my camera got a fungus. And after that, I was not able to take any really good pictures. Nora, probably about a year and a half of my being there, her house caught on fire. And she went in and pulled out all the children, all the women's children. I think there were like seven children. And in the process, she had third degree burns. But she sent word to me that I was to come bring my camera and take her photo. She's posing. <laughs> She's even got a bit of a smile on her face, although she was probably in extreme pain. But her husband was a wealthy man. He owned a taxi business, running people up and down the road. He could take her to a clinic where there were European doctors. And you'll notice her wounds are dressed. She survived it and came out of it with just scars. Anybody else in that environment, the infection rate would be sky high. But... Yeah, she wanted, she didn't need anything from me. We asked her, do, what do you need? Do you need money to pay for it? No, no, I want my picture taken. So there it is. Mm -hmm. And I do apologize for the horrible quality. Schools were built by care. And this is the way the school in my village looked. Kids would share seats, table, desk were so-so. You were lucky if you had a chalkboard, but it was better than nothing. and. There are two peaceful volunteers, one in this photo teaching school. And that's what a lot of volunteers did. They taught school. Um, I say nowadays, volunteers have a whole different, they've got access to the computer, internet, cell phone. It's not the same now for a volunteer. You are linked in, you could talk to your parents every day. I had to write a letter that would take months to get to me. <laughs> there was no telephone. There was no way to contact anybody. So it is different if, if you were to go now. But back then, that was, you were really cut off. But basically, we had people that taught English, some science, some math, and health. Most uh, people in the villages made it through the sixth grade. I had a sixth grade health class, and most of them were men that were 15 to 16 years old in the sixth grade. They were lucky they had that. I think that explains why they were interested in birth control. Um, the mission schools run by missionaries were probably the much better schools. They had supplies, they had teachers, they had money. So higher education was available if you lived in an area like the town of Bonga had a Catholic mission that had a very good school. Where I was, there, there was nothing else. So that was it. Uh, things I had to deal with. Fish heads. <laughs> Fish heads are one of the least of my worries. Um, a lot of strange foods. You know, I learned to really like dried fish. Not just fish heads, but dried fish. It was called dried bony because it had so many bones in it. Uh, I could do collard greens because I grew up in the South. Potato greens were a lot like other greens. Cassava was sort of like a potato. But palava sauce was slimy. I could do okra because I grew up eating it. Palava sauce was one I could never get to. It was a, it, it, for some reason, it was a gooey, slimy kind of sauce put on top of rice. Um, fufu, I could never get in, into fufu either. It was uh, cassava that was grated, fermented, so it had a rather rank smell to it. 
boiled into a big mass of dough. And you would ask a Liberian, why are you eating that? It fills the belly. There's a big carbohydrate load that just fills your belly. And you would break off a piece and dip it in soup. My hardest was getting used to outhouses. And luckily, <laughs> I eventually had a pretty decent bathroom, but I, I think I would still have that issue. And public toilets were worse than outhouses. If you had a nice outhouse, the whole village would come use it. So, um, and the snakes like to go in there at night when it was cold. So you'd have to knock on the side to make sure there were no snakes roaming around in there before you went in. So they were a lot worse than fish heads. Um, <laughs> yeah. Safe water. We had to boil and filter our water. It was not safe. I think I got dysentery when I ate a salad at a restaurant down in Greenville that there's no way you can sanitize a tomato or a piece of lettuce without ruining it. And I think it must have had it. So it wasn't safe. It wasn't clean. I got dysentery. Uh, wet season. That's the road through my village in wet season. And um, it was mud. Dry season, it was dust. And I did catch rainwater in a barrel to supplement what I had in the the, the thing that I had where it was elevated with gravity pushing it in. And that was cleaner water because it came out of the sky. But we still we still boiled it, filtered it, even though it would have been um, rainwater. So, oh, and you know, so six months of rainy season could make you a little crazy. You welcome dry season and then you realized all you wanted was a day with some rain to get rid of the dust. So there's my mask. That mask came via uh, a gift, and I can't remember who gave it to me. It might that one might have been Sarah. Um, it was 1974. I have a hard time remembering who did what. The local witch doctor. This was my neighbor Peter, and he brought this dancing devil over to my house. They always came to my house, and if I took their picture. I knew I was probably going to cough up twenty dollars. Ten, twenty dollars is, you know, you took my picture. But the uh, he had brought the devil over. That's the care school behind me, looking up from my house. My friend Sarah, that's her house there. But um, we had to learn that there were good devils and bad devils, and there were times you could interact with the devil, and there were times you couldn't. They still had secret societies. These little boys might even be part of a secret society. I did not take this photo. Another volunteer did, but I got a copy of it. Um, secret societies are where they learn their tribal customs and how to survive in the bush. And they, that's when boys get circumcised. Um, and they come out of there. They're considered to be no longer little boys, but men. So these boys are gone, have gone into uh, bush school. We, ever, we would call it a rite of passage? Yes, yes. Um, like I said, I didn't take it, so I don't know a lot about it other than generally when you saw the paint, that's what it was. But again, we were told that when the devil came to town, you shut your doors, shut your windows. I just had screens with cloth over mine. And you turn the lights out, the lamp, <laughs> and you stayed inside. So that's what I did. So one night I hear they're playing the drums. There's a bonfire up there. And it was literally right in here in front of Sarah's house. There were people singing, dancing, drums playing. Uh, the piano, that's, they call it a, a country piano. It's a gourd with about three metal prongs that they play, very tonal repetitive. So I could hear it, so I did what I was told, shut the doors, pulled the curtains over the windows, turned out my lamp, and I went to bed. And about that time I hear footsteps, people coming down the path right there to my door. Women, it was women's voices, speaking dialect, and I hear, <laughs> you must come and I went no 
<laughs> they called me Missy. They eventually gave me a tribal name. It was Jala, which meant happy girl. I know, that was a sweet name, Jala. And uh, no, I, I'm okay, I'm here. No, Missy, you must come <laughs> over and over. You must come, you must come, the devil wants you. And about that time, my heart's like beating at a fast rate. Finally, I thought, okay, if they really want to hurt me, they can break into this house, which has no, nothing covering the windows, the door you could kick in. If they really want me, they can get me. I may as well go. So I put my clothes on. I went out. The women carried me up. I thought it was neat that the women's job was to come get me, you know. And I get up there, and the devil's dancing around the bonfire. And I'm standing there watching, and he comes over to me, and about that time he grabs me around the waist. <laughs> I think I felt like I jumped this high. I probably jumped, you know. But I felt like it was like, here, I scream bloody murder. And they all just started laughing. <laughs> well, good rule of thumb is if they're laughing at you, they're not going to hurt you. <laughs> so I just kind of at that point went, okay. I still wasn't thinking about it. It's how they all got to see me. I'd been there three weeks. And it was time to bring out the Peace Corps volunteers so we could all see her. And after that, I felt very relaxed in the village because when the devil came, I could take his picture, give him $10, and I knew I was okay. Rumor was my neighbor Eddie was a devil, but he never confirmed that. But the fact that Peter's with the devil told me Peter had some power. Peter's the gentleman on the left who, uh, that was his baby in the opening picture. And he would bring his wife over to my house and say, you listen to the Peace Corps woman. That was their first baby. She was the first wife and he adored his wife. I, this baby's gonna be healthy and the baby was healthy. That was one of the fattest, cutest little babies. And I watched that baby be born. They asked me to cut the cord, and I said, no, thank you. <laughs> the old mom will cut the cord. So she did, thank goodness. I probably would have passed out. But um, Peter was the one who would read my leftover Newsweeks, devoured them. He could read, devoured the Newsweeks, and would didn't come over to talk what he had read, and was the one who came to tell me Nixon had, I knew it, but to say, Nixon's resigned. You had bad people, too. Okay, so uh, this is that same devil, and that's a school teacher on the right who's very intimidated by the devil. And I was told that that was a female devil, and that's why it was intimidating him. That's, I was told that. Um, I never knew who was under there. They could be ceremonial. If there was an election coming, the devil would come to endorse somebody, and that person would get the votes. When somebody very, very important died, the devil would come out. Um, occasionally the devil just showed up for various reasons. I never knew the what and wherefore. I just knew to make sure it was the kind I could see. Yes? Could you have more than one devil show up? At one time? I never, I never did, but I think it could be possible. And different cultures, some of them have them on stilts. Uh -huh. Some tribal groups had, that, they were all different. But they all had kind of the same idea of a mask, a headdress, some type of straw skirt and cloth. Yeah, and the guy, there's always somebody walking with him. I guess it'd be like a, you know, when we see mascots and somebody's leading them around, it may be hard to see. Yeah, and that was, uh, yeah, it was right beside my house. So my house was right beside the bush. <laughs> but I did. I was asked to go and pay my respects to an old man who had died. It was about an hour's walk into the bush and several women and I went. And it was an honor that I would go down and pay my respects. So I went in, he'd been dead maybe three or four days, wrapped in some kind of cloth. There was no odor whatsoever. Whatever they do works in terms of preserving a body until it's buried. And the, you know, the women were crying that, that lived there. But, you know, we all paid our respects and we left. So it was an interesting thing to uh, take part in. Here's another devil. This is another devil at a different time. And uh, notice people are all gathered around to watch. And that's Eddie. 
like I said, my neighbor on the right side who we thought might be linked to being a devil. So, different devils did come through, though. They were not always the same. Uh, soccer was big, and this was uh, a school that they had enough money that they got shirts for the boys to have soccer team. I think that's cute, because you don't see a regular soccer field. They may do. That Moncali game, the kids, I would see kids playing that, but they didn't have a game. They would punch holes in the dirt and gather sticks or stones and they just played in the dirt, just made holes to play it. They made, adapted. Men had to take care of their wives. Shame on them if they didn't. So if you had one wife, three wives, you had to take care of them. They did the crafts. So here, a guy's weaving a hammock, here he's doing some embroidery. It was always odd that I would see men doing what I assumed were oftentimes women's work. Um, back, let me see if I can go back real quick without, yeah, that dress I'm wearing right there, that would have been made and embroidered by a man. There would not be a woman doing it. Machine. That's a machine embroidery, and they had beautiful batik cloths. You could see the batik there uh, that they would make dresses out of, and that was really a, a nice dress. And the head wraps told you what tribe you were in, and the women in my tribe would say, you look like a Muslim woman, the way I would do the head tie. Um, that's a different dress there, but it's again tie-dye, and it's real lightweight, so it it, you know, it was rather cool, and you see she's got on some tie-dye. Um, these are typical American-type clothes. See the little dresses, those kids? That's what they wanted to learn to do, make a little dress out of a piece of cloth, and they could. Okay, let me go back to where I was. Okay. Um, they would do farming, but they would do the big slash and burn part of farming and the women did some of the smaller smaller jobs they often had small stores there was one store in my village and they sold soap canned milk sugar cubes salt cigarettes and beer and it was local beer which was not bad but it was never cold there was no refrigeration so when I would travel, my choices were, there's no such thing as bottled water, <laughs> local beer or Coca-Cola at 90 degree temperature. But it was safe, so I drank it. Um, this was at Sarah's farm, the same one where the old woman saw me, and that's Brenda, she was named after me. She was born a twin, and when Sarah, I told Sarah I was a twin, one died, but the one that lived was named after me. I always, always wondered what happened to her. She's getting her bath. Notice mm -hmm. there's the mortars. You've got a mortar over there. Women had four or five mortars. It, they pounded things. They pounded the shell off peanuts. They pounded the shell off rice. They crushed pepper. They crushed palm nuts after cooking them. You did, that was their blender, their food processor, all of it rolled into one. And my pepper mold, uh, mortar was given to me by a, a woman that lived beside me and she crushed her hot pepper in it and when I got ready to leave she said I'm giving you my pepper mortar to take to your mother and she gave me a live chicken to also take to my mother which we did not take we cooked him um, and everybody had a party but yeah that mortar was used by her just to crush pepper so I had a big mortar like this, and I made palm butter in, in my mortar. And uh, so notice, you know, everything's on the ground. So when you start thinking from a nutrition perspective about food safety and you got chickens and goats getting in everything, babies getting a bath, you know, people wash their clothes in the same water they take their drinking water from and they bathe in, you can see why disease has its, is rampant. So. My job was to promote breastfeeding, to try to teach women they should breastfeed. If you bottle fed, it meant you were wealthy, that you had the money to buy Nestle formula. The only problem is 
You've diluted it with unsafe water. There's one introduction of bacteria, and as the baby got diarrhea or if your money got thin, you stretched it out by reducing the amount of formula in the, in the bottle. So we really tried to talk about breastfeeding. And in the book, nobody in my village talked about body parts or laughed or anything. Breasts were for feeding babies, and that's what they did. And they were not, there was no shame in it. Even in the capital, a woman would pull out her breast and feed her baby. Nobody think twice about it. Uh, it was also to try to teach them that their local foods had a lot of nutritional value. There were limes, lemons, avocados, pineapple, uh, coconut, tomatoes, not many tomatoes though, um, papayas. Oh my gosh, I learned to love papayas. But when people had those, they wanted to take them to market and sell them. They were worth money. A papaya was good for a quarter. You could sell for a quarter, you know. A pineapple, maybe 50 cents. Same thing with chicken eggs. You could sell them. So trying to teach people that your local foods, whether it's collard greens or potato greens or palm butter, had some nutritional value, and you should encourage eating those foods and trying to help them when they introduce food to their baby, introduce those foods at the right time in the right way, they were good. That, that was the hardest job I had and the biggest job I had. Uh, I was also to try to teach them that when, like Peter said, the baby needs boiled water. They boiled the water. Peter listened. So that baby looks healthy. Um, so you can see how hard something like that is to take into a village that wants to be modern, to have formula, to have American foods. Although I don't know where they'd really get them from. Um, and the way I did that, I went from woman to woman to woman to woman. So when I sat down to talk to the women, I'd visit the old Muslim men first, and I'd go visit the women. They had to feed me. I gained 30 pounds. Because to refuse food would be rude. And they ate out of a common bowl with, you always use your right hand, left hand's for the bathroom, right hand's for eating. They would bring my food in a plate with a spoon and give me a little bowl of food. So literally, I went from kitchen to kitchen to kitchen and gave 30 pounds. I did not look like I do in that picture, Cindy, <laughs> when I left. I was kind of plump. Um, but that was the way you got to know the women. You sat down, you picked up the baby, you talked about what you could, and you ate, and then you moved to the next house. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then people got to know me, and I learned to fix their foods. They were surprised that I could cook Liberian foods. Um, so again, breastfeeding versus, versus bottle. These babies, these are... These are the other wives that Nora's husband was married to. She's a different tribal person. She's Muslim, and that was a, I don't know if that was a sister or what, but those were the three wives of uh, Nora's husband, and these were all the babies. This one was breastfed. This baby was born at the same time was bottle fed. I took that slide on purpose, you know, as just as an illustration of why we were trying to do that. Hernias are real common in African babies. So kids will poke at each other to make fun, but they're very, very common. Um, that was a hard battle because the formula companies were really pushing formula. I had a counterpart. Interestingly, they never put a woman of the same tribal group with me. It was a different tribal group and the same idea to cross you know, cross cultures in other ways, different tribal groups. That was Joyce. She was trained at the, um, at a college in, in Monrovia in agriculture. She probably finished high school, I think, to get there. And they, so each one of us had a counterpart. She spoke, she could understand the dialect a whole lot better than I could. And we were to work together, which was kind of nice. So um, 
You can see I'm starting to put weight on there. Get a little fat. This little girl made that dress by hand and she wanted me to take her picture. We taught her how to sew. And if you wanted people to come here nutrition, then you better offer them something. Sewing, knitting, crocheting. Fascinated by it. Then you could sit and talk about why you need to boil water. If you held a class on boiling water, nobody would come. So you did it one-on-one -on -one or by offering sewing classes. And the little girls really wanted to learn to sew. And they would very patiently stitch that dress by hand with a needle and thread. That's a cute little dress. That's my neighbor Peter's house because it's on my front porch. So again, these, these girls were trained in all the same things we were trained in. Health promotion, uh, water safety, food safety. And they were too interested in sewing and knitting and crocheting. So there were 27 tribal groups and there were at least 27 different tribal groups represented with the, the uh, Liberian counterparts. So food and cooking, there's my mortar and there's no, it's not mine, it's yours now. <laughs> There's your mortar and pot. So some of the foods, and how are we doing on time? We're good? We're good. Okay. Rice was the main staple. Now, interestingly, rice, while it was the main staple of the diet, was mostly imported. They could not grow enough rice to feed their people. It was imported from China. And the, one of the reasons for unrest that led to the Civil War it, it was before the warlords, is when the government, the president, decided to triple the price of rice. And people struggled. And they eventually tied him up on a post on the beach and gutted him. Oh. And that's when the government started going in disarray. All because he upped the price of rice. Awesome. So... Rice was a staple. Cassava was the other staple, and that grew locally. But a lot of people liked rice. You ate rice with greens on top of them. Or palm butter, which was made out. I'll show you what that looks like. That's palm nuts that are cooked, pounded in a mortar. And when you finish, you take all the fiber out. It looks just like gravy. And you put in onions and chicken or fish. Those are the greens. Cassava leaf looks like a little pile of mowed grass. And that's what it smells like. But when you cook it in palm oil, it becomes heavenly. I used to dream about cassava leaf when I came back because I couldn't get it. Okra stew, peanut soup are big. Um, now, dried fish I like because they'd, they'd catch the fish on the coast, dry them, and bring them up country so they were safe. And you just broke up the dried fish into your soup and let it cook till it softened, taking the head off. But... <laughs> But somebody convinced me that I'd get better protein if I bought canned mackerel. So I bought little six ounce cans of canned mackerel and tomato sauce and I made mackerel jollof rice, which is sort of like a fried rice, mackerel salad, like tuna salad, mackerel in my, all my soups. I cannot look at a can of mackerel now. <laughs> it just, I, I gag. But it was my protein source because I could not get eggs often. My cheese was canned. My butter was canned that I bought and took with me. So if I wanted protein, it was either. And bush meat was rare. We did occasionally have somebody sell us uh, bush meat, deer mostly. But sometimes they would say it was deer, but it's hoof didn't look like a deer. So you're never quite sure what you got. Mackerel was safe. So this is Sarah. She's using a big, huge snail shell, and I did try that, land snails. They were not bad, um, to crush pepper. Here she is. Um, ooh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Here she is. Uh, that's the old woman again who thought I was, you know, the ghost. Here she is. She's pounded her rice in a mortar. Now she's doing this to get the chaff away. And this is me killing, she killed the chicken, I cleaned it. I could never kill a chicken. I, I just couldn't do it. But I could make a deal with a kid. You kill it, I'll clean it, we'll split it. And this little girl actually lived with us and we put her into a school when we left um, so that she could get, she was very bright. 
And so she, she was always at my house all the time and helping me clean this chicken. It's funny, after I cleaned it, I didn't want to eat it for a while. <laughs> so palm nuts look like this. They grow on a palm tree. That's palm butter, the nice thick stew they make, and that's palm oil. Now, as a dietitian, I'm going to tell you it is a saturated fat, a bad fat, an unhealthy fat. Not one you want to eat if you want to keep your arteries clear. However, it is high in vitamin A. Africa has an issue with blindness, especially in children, because of vitamin A deficiency. That palm oil gave the vitamin A, to me, would counteract any long-term effects of saturated fat. And these people worked hard. They burned their calories. Um, so again, palm oil is one that's controversial. You know, are you deforest, doing deforestation to produce this palm oil? There's a lot of controversy about it. A lot of kids I taught food science to thought palm oil and coconut oil were the cat's meow. They're saturated fat. But there's a place there's a benefit. Uh, that's cassava, the root. That's the leaf. It looks like a marijuana leaf. I'll, I'll admit that, right? They're all going to say they don't know, <laughs> sort of. But that's what it looks like when it's ground up. And then you cook it in the palm oil. And it's really good. And again, greens would have given me vitamin A. They'd have given me vitamin C. Um, a lot of greens were good in that fiber, healthy fiber. There's dried bony. That's what it looked like when you bought it. It was a dried fish. And you just break it up and let it cook in the soup till it got soft. And you pick the bones out. You could leave the head on or off. Here was my canned mackerel. My cousin came to visit me, and she actually came all the way to the village, and then we took her back to the capital. By the time we were leaving the village, I was cooking dinner one night. She goes, I cannot deal with the mackerel. Can you just leave it out? She'd had mackerel for five days. Um, and yeah, we can leave it out, but it would look like that in a soup. So, again, protein. You can see why I like dried bony. That was a Liberian kitchen. This is a chicken coop. Notice the things for the rice are up on top. Kids all around the kitchen. Like I said, goats and chickens. So. This is how we bought our food. You went to a market and you went from stall to stall. Very aromatic. <laughs> Because you'd smell, you know, a lot of fish, a lot of dried fish, a lot of fresh fish. That's rainy season, so you can see the mud. But that's how you bought your food, went to a market. That's a big market. I had one little store like that in my village to, to shop from. But there were always people that would sell things. There was this Muslim man that had a big earth bakery, and he made the best French bread. And when I had my mackerel salad, I could put it on French bread. And it was, it was doable. Um, agriculture volunteers were there to change from what we call dry rice, upland rice, to swamp rice. That's like me teaching them to breastfeed rather than or encouraging breastfeeding over bottle feeding. That's your malaria. Yeah. And I know. You got water for the mosquitoes. Um, the problem with this is every year they would deplete the ground with whatever they were. When they grew that rice, it would deplete the soil and they would move to the next patch of land and would slash and burn agriculture where you deforest the area. Just so that you can, and it's very labor intensive. This is labor intensive, but once you build a, a water rice paddy, you only have to do it once but you do have to use some fertilization in it. So Peace Corps volunteers were there trying to teach swamp rice production. The yield on this was like seven times that yield. So you got a bigger yield, you only had to clear the land one time, and you didn't burn the forest down. So you killed your population. Mm-hmm. 
But this did not go over well. When I left, people were still, you know, doing rice. And now you see why they import a lot of it from China. So they're slash and burn agriculture. All the people in my village had a farm and they'd go out in the bush and they'd, they'd clean out all this area for their rice farm. And when they did, they would stay on it. They'd build these little thatch huts and they would sleep out there. They'd stay out there for several days. And sometimes women were at home taking care of the babies and doing the laundry and doing all that, and the men were doing that. But sometimes the whole family went. It, it varied, you know, with who was in charge of doing that. So some new opportunities for volunteers. There, there they are. Now it's technology. Africa wants the newest and greatest technology, and you cannot blame them. They, they still need help in economic development, community development. Um, agriculture is still a big need. Health is still a big need. Education and youth development. So pretty much the same opportunities are there as when I was there. And volunteers are connected via the Internet to everybody. You're not cut off. You're not out there by yourself. Well, you might be out there by yourself, but you're not cut off. So, questions. This is a good time for questions. And again, I'm not an anthropologist. I wasn't doing research. Yes. 